shot some video at what is now the museum at Cohatch, which is the co-working food hall. Food hall. That was the one I wanted. Blanked on that one, as well as the surgery center and some of the the newer stuff, kind of on the northern edges of town. So, can you walk us a little bit through, kind of how that narrative around downtown has changed yes. over, you know, really over your lifetime. Yeah, absolutely. And changed because of those investments. So those individual one things that actually didn't turn out to be one things. They turned out to be kind of part of this longer, call it a positive snowball. Absolutely. Effect. There were a few seminal events that have happened, I would say, over the last 35 to 40 years downtown. I think the first thing where people said enough is enough is uh, where the Courtyard Marriott is downtown. Okay. Used to be the location of our arcade, which was essentially, for lack of a better term, our, our first indoor mall. Uh, and it was a very beautiful historic building, very similar to the design of Dayton's Arcade okay. uh, that has recently been uh, revitalized. Which we did another podcast yeah. on uh, not too awful long ago. Exactly. And it was just an amazing good. story. It Go is ahead. great. A w- much smaller scale than that building. Mm-hmm. But and when, arcades were not uncommon, especially in the U.S. and Europe. That's exactly right. And okay. so when that was essentially torn down in sometime in the 80s, I don't want to be inaccurate with my dates, but it was in the 80s, a lot of people started to freak out. I mean, candidly, they were like, you know, that was a major loss to our downtown. We've got to think differently. At the end of the 1990s, sorry, at the end of the 80s into the first part of the 90s, Uh, There were several community leaders that saw opportunity in downtown, but also saw larger opportunity. And they went back out to the general public and asked for another bond issue. In this case, it was really to revitalize some of our parks and recreation assets, but it was also to provide funding to redo the Heritage Center, uh, which was our original city hall and city market. So this was, what was the, the city hall at that point was I assume vacant. Yeah. So City Hall, when downtown was redone in 76, Mm -hmm. City Hall, where it sits today, was opened. So they moved from that museum building from there to the modern building that they are in today. The building saw lots of different uses over the many years, but predominantly it remained as a market in the first floor as it always had been. Mm -hmm. Uh, until the late 90s. So they closed it and re- started renovating it in 93. So in order to do this again, somebody had to persuade yes. the voting public yes. to support this bond. Yes. And you're talking about a community that has basically been struggling economically and socially, psychologically Absolutely. for 30 years. Uh, at that point, we are probably on a 10 to 15 year pretty rapid decline. Okay. Our decline really started in the late 70s, ran through, uh, I would say, the mid-90s to the late 90s, early 2000s. I mean, some would argue that probably, but from my perspective, that's it was about a 20-year period where we really suffered some pretty significant decline. Yeah. And it wasn't helped by, you know, media and all those other things that the only lens through which our community was viewed was one that was, you know, if it bleeds, it reads. And so that didn't help our situation whatsoever. That is a disincentive for investment. So. If I were to look back on what was the thing that started the resurgence, or at least the mindset that we need to do something differently, we need to do something better, it was the arcade coming down. And then it was a group, a small group of community leaders that said, we've got to do something different. And and that was the Heritage Center uh, mm-hmm. revitalization into this world-class museum today. That was followed pretty closely by Clark State uh, deciding to build the Performing Arts Center, which is a 15 mm-hmm. Uh, see performing arts uh, auditorium. It's phenomenal. And Clark State is a regional. It is a t- largely two year. It's a school. largely two year. Yes, it's it's a few, three or four, four, four year. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, and that's that. We could have a whole separate yeah, conversation 100%. about the impact of universities and colleges, absolutely, um, on a community. So Clark State built that massive performance center. Yes, that was probably the first outside of the seven and six rebirth. That was the first massive public investment downtown. And it began this discussion around what can we continue to do? Mm. So in 1998, there were a group of volunteers that came together and they created kind of officially but the Center City Association. And Center City then, it was another year or so before they hired an executive director. But what they did is they brought in the Association of American Institute of Architects. I think I got that right. 
AIA, yep, which yep. is the American Institute of Architects. They had a program called RUDAT, Regional mm-hmm. Urban Design Assistance Team. And some money was raised to bring that group in, and they spent uh, three or four days in the community de- doing charrettes and kind of planning out what downtown could be. Quick side is we always, when you tell people in a community that they're going to re- have to raise money to do something, so often you hear the, oh, 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 oh. and yet this is now twice Oh yeah, in just this little part of the story, let alone previously, where people in this community have said, Okay, we know we got to do that. Absolutely. It's our town. I mean, I could I could go on and on about the resiliency of this community and the way that our town comes together around things that are important and sometimes very difficult. Mm-hmm. But we rally around in it's been my life's experience that we tend to do the right things. Oh. Um, it, it's not always pretty. I always talk about what we do as sausage making. It isn't always pretty to see how it's done. <laughs> But the end result's not too bad. So uh, there's a lot of that in community and economic development, and our community is not any different than most. But when RUDAT was here, it galvanized a conversation around the importance. In fact, they were the ones that it was called the Restart the Heart was the name of the document that they they put out. And what was so important about RUDAT is it gave permission to the community to go after the Main Street designation, formalize what Center City was and where it would focus its attention, which is... Mm-hmm just predominantly the downtown that you see today up to the creek and a little bit south and east and west. And it began a concerted effort to think differently about how we do things. Permission is a super interesting yeah. word in that context. So can you elaborate yeah. on that just a scotch? If you do any kind of development and you have multiple people or multiple entities kind of just mix match doing it on their own and outside of a structure, then who's really in charge of it? Who's really the one that's thinking through it, knowing that no one entity or one person gets it done. But we have found oftentimes you can have a coalition of the willing or you're going to drive people along. And the only way to get a coalition of the willing is to seek the permission of that group to be that cheerleader, to be, Mm -hmm. in this case, the quarterback. And And and, the willing. And the willing. And there were probably some unwilling. Oh, even today, there are still very many, I'm sure, that I think maybe their perspective is a little different, but I'm sure there are still people that don't believe that this is sustainable or the success we're having is is a product, a byproduct of anything strategic. It just happens. Well, it doesn't. And that's that was the purpose of Center City. It was mm-hmm. really, I would say, it was started kind of as an activist group that became very professional and very structured. And not that activists are unprofessional, but yeah. generally it becomes so, emotional. Arguments. Not, al- not always so structured. <laughs> not always so structured. And, no. and oftentimes the arguments are so heavily emotional that you lose sight of mm-hmm. the actual things that you can affect and change. So Center City gets involved. Another really important thing happened in our community in 2000, and that was the Turner Foundation was established. And that's a whole separate story, but essentially a very large private family foundation, a benefactor of our community, and one of those community leaders of the past had passed away and left a significant fortune uh, to the community to create a private foundation, a family foundation. And that's run, it's called the Turner Foundation, and that's run by John Landis as the executive director, grandson of, of Harry Turner. The, the patriarch or the namesake of the, the foundation. But one of their core tenants was this whole downtown revitalization. So oh. now there was significant funding to do the proper planning, to do the proper incentivizing, if you will, without using a government term, but incentivizing people's behaviors. And mm-hmm. so at that time, then we took the RUDAT plan and we brought in a professional design firm, MKSK, it was MSI at the time. Mm-hmm. And we started to look at best practices across the country and in our state in particular. And we saw what was going on at that time at the Arena District over in Columbus. Mm -hmm. Nationwide Arena was just being built, but they built this beautiful park right down the middle that was really meant to spur residential development and growth. Yeah. And we thought we can do the same thing. So obviously same designer. So we actually did design this. I called it a green sword that would pull the the greenery from Buck Creek down into the downtown and create a new center for residential or commercial development to kind of locate a, itself. A new version of Central Park in, you got in New York. In a much smaller one, but the same theory. So we did. We put a plan together. It got codified by the city. We also, at the same time, did a streetscaping plan. Okay. Yeah. It goes back to the prior conversation. 
mm-hmm. the sense of place was essentially gone yeah. in town. There wasn't a real reason for people to come down here anymore. And then if you did, you didn't feel comfortable. So we created a very consistent streetscape plan. And this will tie back to the Performing Arts Center. We coined the area where the Performing Arts Center was and where the museum was as the Arts and Culture District. So okay. we created districts, which you just try stuff. And it, right, it, totally. it didn't stick, but we that was a starting point. That's a, that's a really essential piece, yeah, too, though, just, is a lot of this is just about try stuff. You saw that so-and-so did whatever. You know, let's take a swing at that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's, and just because something like that doesn't work yep. doesn't mean that it wasn't worth doing. You know, it, it's this is a little bit of a rabbit hole, Del, because I think I think we struggle as Midwesterners to fail at all. That's why I think entrepreneurialism struggles in the Midwest. There's a culture of failure. That's an accepting, that's acceptable. We're in a blue collar part of the world. And failure is not an option for people. And you're looked down on if you fail. Mm -hmm. So people that try something and it doesn't work, they're judged because it didn't work. Whereas if you are being progressive about thinking like that, if you have an ecosystem that's rooted in a plan or rooted in something bigger, Mm -hmm. failure is a part of that process. And failure will make it better. But we struggle as Ohioans, as Springfielders, as Midwesterners yes, to fail. We have pockets of great op- entrepreneurialism all over our state and even within our community. Dayton is probably the closest and best example of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that culture hurts revitalization attempts because there's going to be more failures than there are successes in revitalization. It's just a fact. Uh, you just hope that the failures aren't so big yeah. that it kills you. Not yeah. literally, maybe, but figuratively. So- We used that arts and culture as a unifying piece. We did streetscaping plans specific to that district, and then we took elements of that and and put it throughout the entire downtown. Mm -hmm. So now you will see granite curbs around the core block only, but you will see a very consistent brick patterning uh, pattern along the side of the road. Um, That's meant to be a psychological barrier to the traffic. You will see ornate uh, street lights, Mm -hmm. very similar to what was down here originally, maybe not as ornate. But they were not the big, tall lights that you see in many urban cores yeah. that have been a state of reurbanization during the 70s right. where the Clover. lights are so tied. The, the lights. Lights. Yeah, right. exactly. So we brought that all in an attempt to bring the scale and the scope of the downtown back to the pedestrian level and make it more inviting. The city has really done an incredible job of focusing on that. We put arms on it so we could do flags and celebrate our community. Mm-hmm. And people well, often think those things are fluff. Based on what that look yeah. that just crossed your face, you've been hit with that. A- absolutely. Before. I got hit uh, really hard on the granite curbs. That was the mm. first one. Why are we spending so much money on the granite curbs? Well, first of all, the granite curb upgrade was paid for by privately. What we did was an assessment for some of the early uh, entities, the companies, to pay for just the replacement of their concrete. And then yeah. this private entity paid for the difference. Oh. And everybody oh. said, well, that's ridiculous. Why would you put granite down there? Well- what I said to that engineer at the time, who unfortunately is no longer with us, he was a, a dear friend of mine, mm. uh, but he was he was a tough guy, and not a lot of people got along with him. <laughs> but I told him, look, you're not going to have to replace those curbs ever in your lifetime, which unfortunately was absolutely correct, mm. and probably not in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. You could say, yeah, it was a waste of money, or you could throw the private entity under the bus for paying for that, or you could take a different approach and say, you know, that was a really incredible way to leverage a public investment for something that's going to have lasting impact. Yeah. So, nice. but that didn't happen. But you do, you get smacked in the face for doing stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And you just, it's just part of what you do. And I learned a couple of things in that role. One, I was too young to do that job <laughs> because our, that entity you were was, pretty young. I was, I was, you know, mid to late twenties, brand new family. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what I didn't know. I just knew what I thought was right. But I was way too young to, mm-hmm. I didn't have alligator skin. Anybody that's in downtown revitalization, community development, economic development, you need to grow alligator skin. And that's true if you're a devoted volunteer. That's so true. Especially true. true if you're a professional. 100%. And I didn't have that. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't deal with wherever we went to dinner, people wanted to know what was going on. I couldn't deal with multiple entities with a lot of power having their own agendas for the right reasons, but they didn't always mix. I didn't know how to deal with that. And I just, you know, looking back, I, I was I was there at the right time and I was the right person at the right time there, but I was also not prepared for the moment. Um, and so I ended up taking a career change for a little bit. And now I'm back into this. Which yeah. I'm back where I need to be. And I 
I have a lot thicker skin now. I probably have more armor than than actual skin, and that's okay too. Uh, but the reality is, is that's kind of how the downtown redevelopment actually works. And you've seen it in any community you go to. It's very rare that you have a unicorn type moment where something happens and it just stirs it on forever. Right. It's always fits and starts. And we're probably in our third attempt. Looking back to, um, we didn't have all the people in the bus and we certainly didn't have everybody in the same boat rowing in the same direction. That really didn't happen until just 2011. Bus on, yeah. bus on top of the boat? The bus, the the... bus actually drove over. <laughs> they tried to put the bus inside the boat. <laughs> And it sunk both. That's exactly what happened. So, you know, it is what it is. It's probably on the ground under the water somewhere, but we'll, we'll pull it out. We're pulling it out now. It wasn't until 2011 or so that I think began a real change in our entire community in the way we have redeveloped and in the success we're having now. Mm-hmm. It, it's obviously a whole lot of things, but there was a seminal moment there uh, for sure for the community. Um, but downtown has enjoyed a lot of that strategy mm-hmm. and you're seeing it now. And I would really encourage anybody who hasn't been to Springfield or certainly those that have been there and haven't been in a while yeah. to come back. It is not where we want it to be yet. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a constant evolution and it will always be uh, changing. But I think what people will see if they haven't been here or haven't been in a while is tremendous private sector investment occurring. Yeah, We have housing now happening at an unbelievable rate. We used to have to beg developers just to drive through and look at things. Now we have more developers and we know what to do with or, or land to do it with. It's a good problem to have, but many of the old issues still remain. It's cost, it's um, you know anything that it's risk that is just inherent with this kind of uh, development. Um, and while we've done well at creating tools to mitigate the risk, there are only so many tools you can put out there. Uh, sometimes a deal just doesn't work. Right. And we used to be in a point where we, we would take any deal. Now we're more selective about the deals we take because the stakes are higher. And that's a great place to get into the, the last thing that I, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about. So while we've been focused on the downtown revitalization, but the downtown revitalization piece has also been sort of a microcosm of the bigger community region-wide, not just city, right. but county in the larger Absolutely. region, um, that evolution. And in the process, uh, while this downtown work was going on, you lost all that industry, but it has now, the industrial base for the whole region has diversified. Clark State has become a very significant player in that. And we could do a whole other conversation. Yeah. We could do a whole other conversation about how the work of doing economic development has changed so much to the work of developing workforce. Workforce development is economic development. Let's make no mistake. They're, They're not mutually exclusive. You can have the best sites in the world, but if you don't have the people... They're not common. And it's funny, people in our profession uh, would always hear from site selectors and still do today, don't tell me about quality of life. Nobody's going to tell us that their place sucks. Well, the reality is, yeah, everybody does have quality of life. But quality of life, sense of place means more today than it ever has, in my opinion, because it's driving site selection because companies have to locate where they can find people. People go to where they want to live, recreate, Mm -hmm. raise their families. And That happens when you create a sense of place. That's why downtowns are so important and critical to driving that conversation for a community. It has to be part of the the calculus. It cannot be excluded from it, and it can't be the traditional economic development conversations. It's all about workforce and what we're doing to provide the ecosystem. So in 2011 Mm -hmm. was where the community really, I would say, pulled up the, the bootstraps and said, if we did a handful of things, what would they be? And would you be willing as a populace, as a community to be a part of it? And so through the media and through our newspaper and a lot of community uh, outreach, uh, a group was put together to ask and ask those questions. Where should we be focusing in four areas rose to the top? There are actually five, but I'll I'll leave it to four because one of them is now part of of a larger process. But the first was downtown. Okay. So, and I would tell you, the leaders around the table that were coming up with these questions and trying to determine what where we would focus our energy and finite resources, mm-hmm. I think we probably all would have come up with the same four or five things. But to have the community actually say it gave it validity. Absolutely. And it was an open process where people felt like they were a part of it. So that's why it's been sustainable. So downtown was certainly a core to that. Mm-hmm. 
uh, are gateways and corridors. So what are the impressions we give or leave people when they come to our community? And there are four primary gateways places, to our community. Places where people yep. who are either coming in and going out or coming out. Going, yes. Exactly. Uh-huh. Uh, what are we doing there? And knowing that there are no silver bullets in any of this and that they're going to take mm-hmm. time to do them. But mm-hmm. what's just the first impression or last impression people have of our community? What about our parks and, and green space? Um, and it was more the active and passive recreation corridors, particularly in the community. What can be done there to leverage? So we have Buck Creek. Mm-hmm. It's this incredible green waterway oh. throughout the entire county. Yeah. But it goes right smack dab through the middle of our community, right through downtown. Mm-hmm. What are we doing to leverage that? What are we doing to engage that? What are we doing to and that was that? And that was identified. Yes. Parks were... Downtown was identified as a priority by the community, Correct. not just by the, the people who head. talk. Yep, that's yes. Right. Yes. Parks absolutely. and downtowns, including this incredible greenway yep, um, created by the creek. Yep. Um, and we talked before about how that's also, that can be sort of pulled exactly. into other parts of the community. What were the other two? Um, so those were three because uh, of the gateways and corridors. Oh, that's right. I'm and sorry. then the fourth one is the jobs and job readiness. So- what kind of jobs do we seek to retain or and or attract to the community? What are we doing there for to create a workforce? So we were talking about workforce in 2011, Which in 2012. Long before that. Was. Amy Donahoe, our director of workforce development, had already been on our staff for three years as as an employer services person focused on workforce. I would I would That's dare say that our community has been focused on workforce maybe longer than any other community with a strategy. And I would say that and I think I could defend it pretty pretty accurately. That's but we but point. we recognized very early that it's one thing to have jobs, it's another thing to have a mismatch between the skill sets. Yeah. So what are we doing around that? So there were task forces that were created in those four areas. Three of the four still meet on a regular basis, on a oh, monthly wow. basis. Fifteen years later yeah, or absolutely. thirteen years later. One of them, and this was a major turning point for the downtown mm-hmm. When I was doing downtown years following that, uh, whenever somebody would want to invest in something downtown, a building, an entrepreneur would want to do something, they could usually get financing for a portion of that. They may be able to get some other uh, grants or other things to to get another piece, but there was always 10 to 15% of a project that just couldn't get funded. Uh, So we we tried to understand what that was, and we got connected with Jim McGraw with uh, KMK Consulting down in Mm -hmm. Cincinnati from our uh, former CEO of our hospital. Jim was on the hospital board, and the CEO of the hospital at the time was on our board, and they connected us. Okay, cool. And he was the architect, as an attorney, not an architect, but the architect be- behind 3CDC and the Hamilton yeah. Court. Two yeah. very successful urban revitalization strategies from a funding perspective. And we asked him to come here and kind of help us understand what that might look like if we could do something mm-hmm. like that. Oh, okay. So we did hire him to interview several of our community leaders that we felt had capacity to maybe help out in this. And he came back and said, you know, there's capacity here. So we raised about a $5 million capital fund, uh, all by the private sector and private and a couple of public foundations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we've used that since 2016 to today to catalyze much of the redevelopment that you see downtown. And it's it's low interest or no interest loans. Mm-hmm. It's donation of, of property. It's acceptance of property. It's doing studies it's refreshing plans and and doing studies sounds like whatever Do, we're, uh, we're planning refreshing plans so is like whatever failing to plan is planning to fail and what people often don't realize is that planning stuff whether it's architectural drawings or it's you know site plans or it's whatever number one that's often the hardest piece to get funded amen in the whole process of that's getting right. any kind of new development done and the second is that if you don't have that in place and that's not strong, any attempt at any kind of public funding right. or institutional funding from a bank or a, a lender of any type. That's exactly right. You ain't going to have it unless you've got that right. stuff solid and that's the hardest stuff to pay. It is. And now we're so now we're using that mm-hmm. all that planning work and the strategy behind it. We've been executing but now, because we've been successful as a group, and it's a group of, of volunteers that it's called Spring Forward is the fund. Wow. And it's a group of volunteers, mostly the funders of the original uh, piece. But now we're working to engage our banking community, which we chose not to do in the first round. Oh, really? Yeah, we did strategically. We felt like we needed to get the private sector on board first outside of the lending com- community and prove that there are things that are bankable down here. 
So we're using that now to leverage a loan fund that's very similar to the uh, the core funds that had uh, that Citywide does in Dayton uh, yeah. that have been very successful. Mm-hmm. In fact, they're going to be a partner with us in this effort as we move forward. Mm-hmm. But that's happened because there was a strategy around it. So incremental change. Uh-huh. You know, this group started to look at the downtown things and then found the the gap, and then did this spring forward fund. And it was really meant to be a fund. It's become a little bit more than just a fund. Yeah, yeah. But but it's worked really well. The jobs and job readiness piece is obviously something I'm very focused on. That's a whole other podcast, I think. Yeah. But what it did is it really sharpened our ability to tell our story Mm -hmm. and the way we market our community. But the most important thing it did is it, it, it really did bring the boat from the bottom of the water to the surface. It drained it and asked everybody that could play a part in that ecosystem to get in the boat and to start rowing together if we can. But even yeah. if we're going in a circle to begin with, that's okay. And then we did. We did go in a circle for a while. But we started to get not just business around the table, probably less business around the table because we knew what they needed or what they yeah. were complaining about, yeah. rightfully so. We just didn't have the schools on board. We didn't have other workforce partners on board. We didn't have, when I say schools, it's not just the the post-secondary, it's the secondary. So it's the high schools and middle schools. Mm-hmm. They weren't around the table. Mm-hmm. So we got the right people on the table. Good. We did some research. I'm a geek. So everything we do is data informed. And so we brought in the Dayton Development Coalition to help mm-hmm. us kind of do a, almost for lack of a better term, a SWOT analysis. I hate that, but that's what it was. And we found the things that we could lever that were working well. And then we kind of blew up the model and started to create our own partnerships and, and collaborations. And I would encourage there to be a follow-up to this to kind of talk about some of that workforce yeah, uh, work that you, we're doing. It's just incredible. And you, and you have been. So, for example, I, we were talking about um, before we got on this, we were talking about the program at the Dome. Mm-hmm. Um, the workforce development here is starting at the middle school it level. Eighth grade. Right? Which is essential. And it continues not just through high school, not just through the young adult years, but on an ongoing basis. Right. And that is something that people, like we sort of know, but we don't really know. That's right. That workforce development becomes an ongoing process. It's an ecosystem. And it has to be a continuum of things. What I have seen with our peers across the country is to our earlier points, they're looking for a big win. They're looking for a silver bullet program that will change the tide. It doesn't work. Just does not work. Uh, we've tried it. Mm-hmm. It does not work. Uh, you have to have a continuum of things that build off of each other. And what we have found to be the foundational piece of everything that we do now from a workforce perspective is we aptitude test every eighth and 10th grader. We use oh, a tool really? called New Science. We pay for it uh-huh. for the schools. We have done videos and content around the videos and they're in every high school. It is the basis from which we build everything. And that came out of the Job and Job Readiness Task Force. So this group of 40 to 60 volunteers has developed over eight different programs that still are in existence today and are all working together in a seamless way. And it's allowed us then to get funding to get somebody in our schools to help connect them to the Mm -hmm. businesses. Mm -hmm. But it's because we're not doing it in a vacuum. We're doing it with Clark State. We're doing it with the Department of Job and Family Services. So you're leveraging. It's a network. And it's, it's a, a constant it's process an ecosystem. of connecting. That's 100%. And feeling across really that whole ecosystem. We tried. So when we did use science, we tried to get every high school. We have 14 high schools in, in Clark mm-hmm. County. Nine mm-hmm. school districts, 14 high schools. And we tried to get them all on board day one uh, yeah. with this use science aptitude test. No. We got one. Okay, and we and I got really upset about it. I'm like, why can't people see what the value of this? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't make any sense to me. We really realized we had to build a coalition of the willing. Yeah, it's not my term. It's a term from Quint Studer, who's one of our yeah. mentors and just an incredible visionary. But Qu- Quint, the first thing he said when he came here and met with co- the community, he said, "You need a coalition of the willing." And that, when we figured that out, yeah, then we started to get momentum. And now every school district in Clark County is using it. And so we're there, um, it, but it, it's never going to change. It's never going to. It's never going to be done. Yeah, all of those things, Della. We started to have some real momentum building, mm-hmm. and then we won a big project with a foreign direct investment from a Japanese-based company. Okay, and literally as we're announcing that, they're announcing an expansion, and then we get a semiconductor component manufacturer to follow on board, and then we finish our industrial park that we're building, and we get a eight hundred and fifty thousand square foot distribution center. Okay, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and now people are saying, "Wow." There's job opportunities again. Almost over 8,000 new jobs have been committed to be created in the last seven years. 
13,000 jobs total uh, uh-huh. on the retention side, indirect and induced job side. So we had lost 10,000 jobs during that 1980s period. Yeah. Which, now, which in a town this size is unbelievable. humongous. Unbelievable. When you're ta- it, was, it was almost a quarter of our population at that point, uh, maybe a, closer to 20% of our population. So we had lost all of that. We were so close to being break even and then mm-hmm. COVID hit. And we'll never get no community, very few communities that have an urban uh, feel to them. We'll ever get back to the same. They may grow bigger, but it's right. going to look different. Right. Uh, but we are now, once again, we are one of a few communities that are maybe 0.2% growth. Huh. I never look, I, I'm crazy. I never look at the uh, census data much um, because it's so, we're, our rate of change here is so rapid. It's not picked up in that. And nobody expects that to be the case in that's a right. quote unquote Rust Belt town. That's right. And that's a great lead into one of the newest issues, which is one that the 2020 census, you wouldn't Never see it in those that. numbers <laughs> at all. You have received one of the highest rates of Haitian immigration. That's correct. Over, and you said just the last two years. Yeah, it's only two years. So, you now have a an estimated Haitian population of twelve thousand, conservatively twelve thousand people conservatively, in a city where the total population is about sixty thousand. So that's an unbelievable transition. And you were telling me earlier that that population is coming here because of the job availability. That's correct, and because of the fact that. In almost every city, in every community, every rural, anything, across certainly much of the Midwestern U.S., we create more jobs now than we have people to fill them. So we're going to do a follow-up interview with a, a pastor who's been working with the Haitian population. And he said that, you know, people are amazed at the kind of work that they can do and that the employers are saying, these are fantastic, fantastic employees. Absolutely. So that's a massive. And of course, yeah. Springfield had plenty of immigration back 100 years this ago. This is our third immigration. Yeah. But it's the first one that didn't speak English. And this is the first one that is coming in, you know, no. within the lifetime of oh, yeah. anybody yeah. who's alive. Absolutely. So that's been, and that's still a story that's very, very new. It's like, new, it's raw, it's changing, but in many ways it's exciting from my perspective. You know, I certainly, I see real challenges when you have growth of any sort at that magnitude. Yeah. Um, the good news for our community is we have an infrastructure that was built to support 80,000 people. So oftentimes it's an infrastructure issue. That's not the case here. It's become a housing issue, mm-hmm. which we didn't have new housing for over 40 years. Yeah. And now, we're, now we're seeing yeah. it in the thousands coming to the community, which is, again, another story. But the Haitian immigration or new Americans, as they like to be called, it's a fascinating issue to unpack. Certainly, there are significant uh, cultural and language barriers that are, frankly, problematic. And not just to them, uh, but, but to the people that live that have lived in this community mm-hmm. and are now trying to understand how to help a new population assim- assimilate. Mm-hmm. There's tremendous pressure that's being put on our school districts, particularly our city school district. I mean, upwards to 100 to 120 new students a month coming into the district that are non-English speaking. Uh, So think about what it does to the classroom setting. Think about what it does from interpretation. So it's a resource issue. And we should note that that the Haitian language is not French. It's French Creole. It is a French Creole. So it is, you can't just bring in someone who's a French, yeah, the French teacher can't can't translate French. That's right. Yeah, so there's the huge... A challenge and shortage of non-English speaking translators. And mm-hmm. Because it's not just, we have had some growth in Mexican and Spanish uh, speaking dialects, uh, certainly, and we've accommodated that to a large degree. But now you add on top of that, the pressures, you add on top mm-hmm. of that, uh, of the Haitian population, and it's it's pervasive. The other big piece is just cultural things. And, and I think there's a lack of cultural sensitivity um, or rather ignorance, I would say. A lot of people in Springfield, a lot of people don't leave their own community and, and have the uh, good fortune of seeing the rest of the world or even other parts of the state or, or mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. You've got, so they don't know what to expect. Well, the same goes for someone that's relocating from a, a third world country. 
It is a challenge. Mm -hmm. But with any challenge comes opportunity. Sounds very cliche. So what our community has done to, to rise to this is create a Haitian task force, a Haitian coalition. City and county government's been very involved, but now social uh, service providers, uh, our organization, other groups, United Way is taking a very big role. Our health department is pay, taking a very big role okay. in trying to understand the needs on on every side of this. And to, and the community is involved in that. Yeah, well. it is. And they, look, there has been some hatred and vitriol that's come mm -hmm. toward this population. I just struggle personally seeing that, but but I also, in some instances, to some degree, understand there is some sensitivity to something new happening around you. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't just happen to those that are coming in new. It also happens to those that are already here. Uh, it, it does not excuse people to act insensitively. However, that that innate fear that some folks from our yeah. community may have is just as real in many cases as the fear that those coming here may have. It's just different, but it, right. it's a fear. Right. Um, and so emotion is driving a lot of that. But I think when you peel back the emotion of things, uh, and take tragedies and put them aside because there have been some of those things too. Mm -hmm. You get to the essence of what the what the issues are, and they are cultural and they are ling linguistic. It is not a look ethic issue. Uh, yeah, it has been my experience, it's been my understanding, and it's been my direct observation that um, the Haitian community that is here and that is employed tends to do exceptionally well at assimilating into the workplace. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen initially. But it's happening over time because employers are becoming far more uh, smart and intentional about assimilating them into the workplace. So, yeah, look, and, it, there's, and there's always a learning curve. There is always a learning curve. And this will continue to be uh, a challenge for us. But um, I do believe there's incredible uh, opportunity here. What I see uh, out of it is we are seeing an influx of population. Mm -hmm. They're talking. They have seen something great here, so they're encouraging others to join them. Absolutely. It could have gone the other way. Absolutely. And it still could go the other way if, mm -hmm. if the assimilation doesn't happen quickly enough or in a, a thoughtful way, mm -hmm. uh, as thoughtful as it can be. Mm -hmm. But I do, I am concerned that we will have such rapid change and rapid growth that that assimilation won't happen at a speed that can be absorbed. And the thing that scares me the most, and it's already happening, mm. is just terrible living conditions for many of these families. I mean, it's ah. dozens in a household kind of uh, scenario. Um, and that's a real issue that's being addressed, uh, or at least is being identified and coming up with ways to address it, but mm. perhaps. But I believe strongly that our best days as a community are ahead of us because we have always learned how to rise to the occasion. I told you this is our third immigration of mass of mass proportions. Yeah. All three of them were workforce driven. Two of the three were were English speaking. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't a barrier. There were some mm -hmm. cultural issues, but it wasn't a linguistic one. Yeah. I believe we'll figure it out. Yeah. I believe Absolutely. we will meet the needs of our community moving forward because of the way we have risen to this occasion. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an exciting time in Clark County to be here because so much has happened. When I look back over the last 20 years, I see the changes downtown as frustratingly slow. But when you listen to people that haven't been here for a while or Madison, who's left at times and come back, right? Uh -huh. You probably see a different. These, your, your colleagues oh, yeah. here have seen probably tremendous change that I wouldn't even pick up on. That's exciting. When I hear it from others, it makes... And that's such a crucial perspective for someone who's doing the kind of work that you're doing. Again, whether you're a volunteer, who, a devoted volunteer, or you're, you know, a professional in the space, is you need to hear that external voice because it is so easy for people to get burned out and frustrated yes. and fail to see a cause for optimism. Absolutely. And yet that optimism is very often there. The fascinating thing to me is that I think that immigration, those new citizens, that's where that revitalization, it's almost like that revitalization of buildings and spaces in the downtown has created a revitalization or has seeded a revitalization of first the larger economic basis and now of people moving in. I mean, most Rust Belt cities, I completely understand that it is very difficult to um, to to 
build relationship with a community that is coming from a very different cultural background where you don't have a whole lot of frame of reference. Um, But there's such an incredible opportunity there for a whole new level of renewal. You go find some really, this is sounds flippant, but it really isn't. You're going to find some incredible restaurants and, and cultural, you're going to find some art and you're going to find music that will just blow your mind. And it's probably already coming out and it's going to be there. And there's so many communities across the country. I'm thinking particularly of places like Wausau, Wisconsin, which had an influx of a manga population. And the term is H-M-O-N-G. And that's a subculture from uh, Cambodia and Laos who came to the U.S. because they had been, they fought on our side in the Vietnam War. So after many years in uh, basically refugee camps, started to be resettled. I don't know why, but to the upper Midwest, like Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, When I first worked with that population back 30 years ago, there were a lot of people asking the same kind of questions that you're asking right now. And there was an enormous uh, communication barrier because that's a language that isn't related to any other language that we conventionally speak in the U.S., certainly in the central U.S. If you look at those communities today, the, the level of thriving and what has been brought to those communities out of Hmong culture, Interesting. Um, it's, it's stunning. It is absolutely spectacular. Um, it has been a delight for me to see that happen. You're just at the very beginning. I know, and I and I'm really excited to see that too. I'm I'm also very um, cautious to to make sure that we we uh, as a community understand both sides of this yeah situation. And um, I just I believe that you got to look for the good in people, and and yeah. I believe that we owe it to our community to be as welcoming as we can, mm-hmm. but but also not lose our sense of community either at the, at the same time. And so um, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. Um, but I like the fact that we have this opportunity. We could be like many other communities that really have no opportunity at resurrection. And we've been experiencing it for the better part of a decade, if not longer. Yeah. And I feel like the momentum is only getting stronger. And, and our best days are, are clearly very much ahead of us. Even though we've experienced great uh, success over the last decade, there's so much more that needs to be done and so much more we will do. And um, it, it's so awesome to be a part of it. It really, really is. Fabulous. Fabulous. Thank you so much Absolutely. for spending the time. This has been a just a really delightful conversation. I couldn't ask for, for a better way to wrap up. Awesome. So, well, thank you. Let's do one thing, yeah, though, sure. which is if people want to learn more about Springfield, mm-hmm. where should they look? Yeah. What should they do? And certainly they should come and visit. I would say start with visit greaterspringfield.com. It's our Convention of Visitors Bureau website. It is the best place to go to look for day trips, weekend trips, and just general fun stuff about this community. If you want to get really into the weeds, you can visit greaterspringfield.com, which is our chamber website. And that has links out then to the economic development work we do, also to the CBB and other organizations within the community. But visit Greater Springfield is probably the best place to start. Go start with the fun stuff. You got it. All righty. And there's no shortage of it here. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. (laughs) 